Hi guys, today I'm going to do something slightly different. This is a kind of an overview, not really a review, of a board game which I picked up fairly recently. Uh, it's quite an old one. Uh, I think it came out in the early 2000s. 2005, uh, it says on the rule book. Uh, it was with a magazine game. Um, the game is called Bitterender, or Bitterender. And the theme is the Second Anglo-Boer War, or the Great Boer War. And yeah, this is a topic that I've been reading about fairly recently, uh, something that interests me. And yeah, I saw that there's a game about it. There's not very many games about this. Um, Legion Games have produced a couple. They have uh, Redvers Reverse, which is about the Battle of Colenso. And they also have Hill of Doves, but that's about the First Boer War. But there's not many games about sort of the, the grand strategic scale of the war. So uh, I thought I'd make this sh short video just to sort of show it off. Um, and hopefully, yeah, if it's something you like the look of, you can you can pick up a copy. Um, it's not in print anymore, but you, you know, I was able to get it quite easily on the second hand market. So hopefully wherever you are in the world, you'll be able to, to find a copy of this if it's something that interests you. Um, so yeah, I'll just give you a brief overview of, of my thoughts on it, and then I'll kind of show you a little bit about how it actually works. Um, so as you can see, it's got some really nice little counters. Um, all of the pieces have got nice little bits of artwork on them. So here we have the Durban garrison. Um, you can see the picture in the top shows you that it's infantry. The little G in the top right shows you it's a garrison. And then we've got the three, which is its combat factor. And then you have the movement factor on the right. The garrisons don't move, hence why it's a zero. Um, I'll give you another example here. So this unit here is some cavalry. They have a combat factor of one, but they can move two spaces. Um, it's an area movement game, as you can see. So you you know your troops will be moving around these areas. Uh, rivers, interestingly, don't affect movement or combat. They're purely just there to mark, well, the, you know, where the rivers are in real life, and they act as kind of borders between areas. Um, that is one thing I find slightly odd. I'm sure there's reasons for that, but, you know, part of the reason why there were battles at Colenso trying to get across the Tugela River was because, you know, Colenso has an important crossing there with the railway bridge. That's what, uh, uh, Redvers Buller was, was trying to, to get through so he could relieve the siege of Ladysmith. So I'm not really sure why rivers don't affect movement. I think they should, but... As I say, perhaps the scale of the game, um, you know, each turn is a month, essentially. Um, you could argue that they build pontoon bridges and things, which they did do in the war. So, yeah, we'll ignore that. It's not too much of an issue. Um, overall, the gameplay is actually quite simple. So this was a magazine game that came with um, Against the Odds, I believe, was the magazine. Um, and it's, yeah, it's it's fairly simple. So there is a... Sequence of play, it's got uh, 10 steps. Um, so you have reinforcements, you have rail movement, which is something I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. So you can see here, these railways allow you to move a lot faster, which is quite good. You have naval movement, so areas with these anchors on mean that the British can transport troops with their navy. Um, yeah, so we have you have movement, various movement phases, then we have combat, and then finally you have what's called the uh, war commitment phase and the empire blockhouse and barbarism phase. I'll let's see if you can see this here. So these last two phases here are what give the game a lot of its flavour. Um, essentially, after you've done all your movement and combat, you sort of see how the war is going for your side. So if you're the Republicans... Um, and that is the term that they use for the Boers in the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, which is this kind of purple coloured area underneath the Dice Tower. Um, they're just known as the republics, uh, the, the, the Boer republics. Um, they have what's called a war commitment total, which is tracked on a separate sheet. And you spend war commitment points every time you fight, uh, whether it's attacking or defending. Um, and you will gain a certain amount of war commitment back um, based on the number of areas that are still in Boer control. So obviously as the as the British, or what's called the Empire player in the game, you're trying to move around in the Transvaal and the Orange Free State to 
capture areas or at least bring them under your control. Later on in the game, um, and that's where we have this empire, blockhouse and barbarism phase, um, you can actually start raising settlements. Um, essentially, the overall commander in the theatre, um, General Roberts, I believe his name was, um, ordered that the settlements were to be burned so that the Boers sort of stopped getting so much supply and support from home. The idea was that that would hopefully bring them to the negotiating table and end the war, which, of course, it didn't, at least at least initially. Um, so, yeah, it, it, the way that, that's represented in this game is that you have uh, Kitchener, who takes over control of, of the theatre, uh, Roberts goes goes home, um, and you can use Kitchener to sort of march around and raise settlements, and that has a really bad impact on the Boers because they can no longer get war commitment from that. So it's it's an interesting way to represent the kind of later stages of the war. Um, for those who don't really know much about it, there's essentially two halves to the Second Boer War. It started off with these, you know, big pitched battles um, over in the east here and on the west on the other side of the map. And then after the British captured uh, the major cities that they were after, uh, because the Boers didn't surrender, it then turned into a guerrilla war. And all of that is represented well in this game, which I think is really good. Now, I've only played a, the small, a small scenario, uh, which is called the March on Pretoria. Um, it says it's an ahistorical scenario, but it's, it's a good way of getting used to most of the mechanics of the game. So I, that's what I've just been trying this afternoon, and uh, I think it went really well. Uh, I was able to pick up the rules quite quickly, and I'll give you sort of a brief overview of how it works now. So... Towards the start of a, of a turn, or at the start of the turn, you'll have reinforcements, and the counters have a little number in their top left, as you can see there. It says 5. That means on turn 5, this unit here is going to be available for reinforcements. The British will bring them on into ports. Um, well, actually, they'll come into uh, Cape Town, which is right at the bottom of the map, and then you can use railways and naval transport to, to bring them into certain port locations across the coast. Then you have uh, rail movement. So the way rail movement works is, I'll give an example. If we, let's just imagine that there's no one actually in this location. Essentially, if you have a, a unit which is in an area that's attached to a railway, they can move an unlimited number of spaces, essentially, as long as they don't pass through any areas which have enemy units in them. Um, so it's a really good way to get your armies moving across the board quite quickly. So this is a full size map, this is a single map game, but it's a big map, lots of railways. So railways are really important when you're trying to move your reinforcements, especially for the Boers, because they don't have uh, naval movement. And also the Boers don't receive reinforcements. All of their units start on the board at the beginning of the game. And once they're gone, that's it. The British, whenever they lose units, they will come back at a later turn unless they surrender as part of a siege, but I won't go into all of the rules for now. So, yeah, so you have rail movements. Uh, land movement is, is pretty is pretty self-explanatory. You know, you have the movement rating, which is the number on the right-hand side. Units can move that number of spaces. Uh, infantry essentially can move one. Cavalry can move two. Uh, all of the Boer commandos, these are called commandos, uh, they all move two spaces. Um, except for the these big army counters here. So these are big 12 powerful units. Uh, you know, you, they, they move around a bit more slowly, but they're worth quite a higher number of combat points. So that's quite good as well. Um, there's rules for screening, which is quite good. Essentially, you can't just walk straight past an enemy stack. You have to leave troops behind to screen them, uh, and then your cavalry can keep moving. So there, there's lots of period flavor included in the rules but it's all very simple you know there's no complex supply or anything we do have these supply units here um, they essentially allow a besieged army to attack out of the town that it's that it's stuck in um, and also they allow you to attack so you need to be uh, within a marching distance of a supply unit so usually within one space of a supply unit to be able to attack Nice and easy, nice and simple, but it's really good that that's included because it means that, uh, you know, supply was a big thing during this war um, and most wars, as, as, as you're probably aware. So it's great that that's included as well. 
So, yeah, the way the game works is is fairly simple. So you move, uh, you both have an opportunity to move around. And then when, you, when it comes to combat, let's say, for example, that these two Boer Commando units had moved into Estcourt here. So we have units in the same space, that's fine. They don't have to get into combat with each other. But let's say, for example, now we move on to phase six. Oh, you can't see that, my apologies. Phase six of the turn, which is right at the top there, Republican combat phase. So now the Republic player decides, okay, I'm gonna attack this British unit here. Now, I mentioned the war commitment. What the Boer player now has to do is because there's no leader here, these two units can't coordinate, is the term that is used in the game. They can't coordinate, meaning you don't add their combat factors together. The British always add all of their combat factors together. So that's why this army here has gone in for this one, because it only has a combat factor of one. So we'll pick five. Now the way it works is, although it says five on the counter, that doesn't mean that he has a combat va value of five. What you have to do is spend war commitment up to the value of the unit that you've chosen. So at the moment, it's off camera, you can't see, but the Boers have a total of 43 war commitment points. So that sounds like a lot. Uh, it can go up to 399. But you have to remember, as the war goes on, that is going to be going down every time you fight or are attacked and you're defending. It can go up when you you know, maintain control of areas, but generally it's going to be going down. So you do want to be careful as the Boer player and pick your battles so that you're not just burning through your war commitment. So in order to attack at full strength, we would spend five. But let's say, for example, we're feeling quite lucky and we're happy with three to one odds. We can just spend three points here and have a combat factor of three. So that's what the Boer player is going to do. So we decide that we're just going to spend three war commitment. Three versus one, nice and easy. That's a three to one odds. And you can see on this combat results table here what the uh, combat results will be. So three to one on the right hand side. The attack are the Boers, nothing bad can happen to them. Uh, DR means defender retreat. And DE is Defender Eliminated. So we're going to roll 1d6. And we've got a 2, which is a Defender Retreats on the 3 to 1. This unit here would then retreat into a, a nearby friendly area. So we'll put him in there. And that's that's how combat works. Um, these boys now are in control of Escort. So you put one of their little control markers down. And that's going to have effects later on in the turn when it comes to working out the morale of the British. So while the Boers are tracking their war commitment, the British are tracking their morale. And that represents the, the kind of willingness for the, the British government to, to continue fighting. Uh, interestingly as well, there is a, a small rule here. You can see on the right hand side, this reminder by the turn track, uh, you have a UK election. And it's possible if the British morale is low enough by this point, which is turn 13, um, that the khaki election goes wrong and the kind of anti-war government takes takes over, gets elected, and uh, the British can lose the game immediately. So it's a really fascinating way of representing the whole war. Um, not only is it a traditional kind of, you know, it's not hex encounter, no, but it's a, you know, a counter based war game with combat factors and things, but there's also these other elements that you need to, to consider, which I really like, the war commitment, the morale of the British, um, you know, there's there's elections later on in the game, you can get blockhouses and things, you can siege towns, it's very good, um, something I really like, and yeah, it's a unique little game, um, as I say, you can pick it up quite easily on the second hand market, hopefully, and I just, yeah, I thought it was something that, uh, that you guys might find interesting. Um, so this this scenario here, the, the British won essentially. Um, we'll put things back roughly how they were. So these guys were in here. So the, the British, um, the Natal started off with a couple of um, Boer areas. Um, I think they were over here somewhere, it doesn't matter. Um, and the British essentially to get a minor victory had to, to push the Boers out of Natal. 
ideally we also wanted to make our way right up north over here and capture Pretoria which is up that way but uh, we got a minor victory so the British land is down here at Durban and we're able to march this big stack as well as uh, these forces are here to basically prevent you having to carry around these big stacks um, where they're going to get knocked over so this here is this here is force five so you can see we've got some big 10 strength brigades in there but rather than pushing these around on the map and then falling over everywhere you can just use these force counters so yeah the british one in this example uh they got quite lucky with a couple of the the battles uh the boers all had to retreat into zululand um if the game was to carry on for longer than two turns then the boers would have to leave these tribal areas as quickly as possible um otherwise they're eliminated and um, yeah, unfortunately for the boys, they weren't able to to take any areas within within Natal. They, as I say, they started off with some at the beginning of the scenario, but the British were quite lucky, and uh, they were able to move some troops forwards and get some some bigger armies up here to uh, fight, and they sort of pushed them out. So, uh, victory for the British in this example. But I'm definitely looking forward to playing some of the other scenarios. There are, let me check, I believe there's a total of three scenarios in the game. So you have you have the main, you know, the main grand campaign, which is 32 turns. Um, but then you also have a smaller scenario, which is just the first year of the war. Um, and then you have the, the small introductory scenario, which is just two turns, which is the one that I played. So overall... I think excellent game. Um, Playtime of the full game. I'm not sure what they claim on the rules here, but I would guess probably three hours, three to four hours, um, if you're going to play the full campaign. But as I say, you, you can just play the first year of the war as well. Um, really nice counters, uh, really nice map. Obviously, I'm playing here on, on Plexiglass. It's a, it's a paper map. Um, yeah, excellent game. Highly recommend it. Um, yeah, hopefully you found this interesting. Um, and yeah, if there's any other games like this that uh, you recommend or that you enjoy, especially if they're based on sort of lesser known conflicts, then uh, yeah, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, thanks very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.